Welcome to the new special exhibit at the Kansas Museum of History in Topeka, Upward to Equality, Kansas Women Fight to Vote. I am Sarah Bell, the guest curator. I am dressed as a suffragist, like the women who were battling for voting rights in Kansas long ago. This exhibit was created to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution and the courageous women who made it possible. The title of the exhibit comes from a quote by national suffrage leader Elizabeth Cady Stanton. The history of the past is but one long struggle upward to equality. Governor Laura Kelly greets you when you arrive with an encouraging message about this important piece of Kansas history. So why did women want the right to vote? It seems obvious to us today, but it was a battle in the 19th century. Some reasons were, they were subject to laws that they had no voice in making amounting to taxation without representation. A democratic government should not exist without equal rights for all. Without the vote, women saw themselves as classed with minors and people of unsound mind. Women would bring a much needed morality to politics, and women had political views and agendas they wanted represented, to name a few. Many women worked for women's voting rights, but they did not all do it in the same way. Who Am I in the Struggle for Suffrage is a quiz where you can learn how your skills and interests match with one of 16 people who had a role in the campaign. The exhibit is a chronological history of the suffrage movement in Kansas. It took roughly 58 years from the territory's founding in 1854 until 1912 for women to gain voting rights. Their route was never easy or direct. The exhibit also highlights Kansas women who worked on the national level for the successful passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Along the way, you may be surprised at how many firsts were accomplished by Kansans. When Kansas became a state in 1861, it was the first state to allow all women the right to vote in school elections. In 1867, Kansas attempted another first. It became the first state in the country to try to amend its constitution to give women and African-American men full voting rights. At the time, national suffrage supporters in the East believed Kansas was the only state that could accomplish this feat. They remembered territorial Kansas as the battleground against slavery. And the same abolitionists who came to Kansas to make it a free state also supported women's rights. One of these abolitionists was Clarina Nichols. She and her family left Vermont with the New England Emigrant Aid Society. This group of staunch abolitionists moved to Douglas County. In her words, I could accomplish more for women, even the women of the old states, and with less effort, in the new state of Kansas, than I could in conservative old Vermont, whose prejudices were so much stronger than its convictions. I went to work for a government of equality, liberty, fraternity. Even with campaign support from national leaders, including Lucy Stone, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the amendment failed. The 1867 defeat also broke the alliance between white women and black men to work together to get voting rights at the same time. Some women, like Lucy Stone and her husband, Henry Blackwell, teamed up with abolitionist Henry Ward Beecher to form the American Woman Suffrage Association. They supported the 15th Amendment, giving black men the right to vote, along with women's suffrage. The year 2020 marks the 150th anniversary of the passage of the 15th Amendment. While African-American men legally gained the right to vote in 1870, many still faced racist obstacles on election day, including poll taxes, literacy tests, and a grandfather clause. Unfortunately, not until the Voting Rights Act of 1965 did African-Americans gain unrestricted access to the polls. The Women's Christian Temperance Union, or WCTU, worked to advance women's voting rights, in addition to its major focus to promote prohibition. The WCTU believed alcohol should be banned because it ruined the home. At a time when women did not participate in politics, the WCTU provided a respectable way to be involved in public activities. Many WCTU women also supported suffrage because having the vote would give them more power to enforce prohibition. The debate over the ban on alcohol would have a major effect on the women's suffrage campaign. In 1878, 
voters elected Republican and prohibitionist John St. John as governor. As the new governor, he called for decisive action on the liquor issue. Kansas became the first state to ban alcohol by constitutional amendment. Democrat George Glick was elected governor four years later. Glick thought the state's stern prohibition law was too extreme and failed to serve its purpose. Suffragists saw their opportunity. Realizing that full suffrage would not be supported by either party, they settled for an incremental gain. Kansas suffragists convinced Republican legislators to give women municipal suffrage, the right to vote in city elections, so they could help keep prohibition enforced locally. The plan worked. In 1887, the Kansas legislature granted women the right to vote in city elections, another national first. The same 1887 law granting municipal suffrage to women also guaranteed their right to run for city offices. Syracuse elected an all-female city council in April 1887, a national first. Susanna Salter from Argonia became the first woman mayor in the country. At this time, the National Woman Suffrage Association adopted the color yellow for their suffrage badge, the color of the Kansas sunflower. It was to honor Kansas as the most progressive state for women at the time. Not everyone, however, believed women's suffrage was a good thing. Marsh Murdoch, founder of the Wichita Eagle and city leader, wrote regular editorials against it. Murdoch argued that women should not vote because God had placed them in the home, not in public life. Furthermore, women should not need to vote as men would protect women's interests at the polls. Building on the momentum from securing municipal voting rights, Kansas women positioned themselves for another attempt at full suffrage. Colorado had passed full women's suffrage in 1893, and Kansas women hoped for a similar victory in 1894. Racism continued to play a predominant role in the suffrage movement. White suffragist speeches focused on promoting their own civilization and respectability as justification for the vote. In addition to distinguishing themselves from immigrants and minorities, white women argued that being denied suffrage made them the political peers of the most uncivilized and least respected members of society, as illustrated in this painting, American Woman and Her Political Peers, by Mr. W. A. Ford from 1893. In this painting, educator and reformer Francis E. Willard is surrounded by a mentally disabled man a convict, a madman, and a disenfranchised Native American. Women held mass meetings in churches and schools. They also took advantage of another platform, the Chautauqua. This religious and cultural movement started in 1874 in western New York State. The movement soon spread to other states, including Kansas. Suffragists used Chautauquas to campaign for the vote, educate visitors on women's rights, and spread suffrage literature. Black women were marginalized in the national suffrage movement. Women like Mamie Dillard of Lawrence, however, led efforts in support of women's suffrage and leadership. In the 1890s, unfortunately, state politics worked against suffragists. The Republican and Populist parties were in battle over the control of the Kansas House of Representatives. The effect was lack of support for the suffrage amendment, and it failed but suffragists never gave up. The world of politics was changing dramatically at the turn of the century. In Kansas, a new generation of suffrage leaders emerged in the wake of the failed 1894 amendment. These women were college educated, involved in multiple organizations and reforms, and eager to assert their influence in the world of politics. Lila Day Monroe was one of these new leaders. A lawyer and public activist, she became the president of the Kansas Equal Suffrage Association and changed tactics for running the campaign. Suffragist Laura Gregg lived in Garnett, Kansas, but traveled the country working for women's rights on behalf of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. There were many others, including Carrie Nation. Nation saw temperance as part of the larger movement for women's rights a movement that also very much included suffrage. 
she took her crusade to Wichita, Enterprise, and Hope before establishing headquarters in Topeka. She is best remembered for smashing saloons with her hatchet. As Nation explained, if I could vote, I wouldn't smash. In Nation's words, the loving moral influence of mothers must be put in the ballot box. Free men must be the sons of free women. To elevate men, you must first elevate women. A nation cannot rise higher than the mothers. Another change affecting the movement was the rise of the Progressive Era. Early in the 20th century, the United States experienced economic, political, and social shifts as reformers addressed problems caused by industrialization, urbanization, immigration, and political corruption. Lucy Johnston embodied the Progressive Era woman. Holding a Doctor of Law degree and membership in at least 10 reform organizations, she fought for traveling libraries in rural Kansas and temperance in addition to women's suffrage. When elected president of the Kansas Equal Suffrage Association in 1911, Johnston proved to be an effective and well-connected leader. Her husband, William Johnston, also a supporter of women's suffrage, served as Chief Justice of the Kansas Supreme Court. Elected in 1908, Republican Governor Walter Stubbs also favored women's suffrage. In January 1911, a majority of both houses voted in favor of the suffrage amendment. The second step, a signature from Governor Stubbs, was easily accomplished. It was time for the third and final step. The people of Kansas would vote. On November 5, 1912, Kansans went to the polls. After wading through a stormy night, suffragists woke to a sunny morning and the news of victory. The constitutional amendment had passed. Kansas became the eighth state in the nation to grant women full suffrage. After decades of work by countless women, Kansas suffragists had won. Victory celebrations extended well beyond the state. Activists across the country saw Kansas as another step toward a national women's suffrage amendment. After winning in 1912, Kansas suffragists turned their attention to campaigns in other states and at the federal level, often working at the direction of National Association President Carrie Chapman Catt. Leading suffragists disagreed about which tactics would bring victory. Alice Paul, leader of the National Women's Party, borrowed militant tactics from the British. She called for women to protest, make a scene, and get arrested. Some engaged in prolonged starvation diets until they were force-fed. Nina Allender, originally from Auburn, Kansas, designed this Jailed for Freedom pin, a small silver prison door with a heart-shaped lock for Alice Paul in 1917. Effie Boutwell, from Topeka, imprisoned for her efforts, was the only Kansan to have received this pin. Carrie Chapman Catt, president of the National American Woman Suffrage Association, used a different tactic. She worked with state legislators and state organizations to bring about a federal amendment. Many called it the winning plan. American entry into World War I in 1917 influenced people's opinion about voting rights for women. Women took on new roles left empty by men in service. In Europe, women served as ambulance drivers, aid workers, and nurses, like Martha Keaton, a graduate of Christ Hospital Nursing School in Topeka. Stateside, they filled the jobs left behind by men fighting overseas. By 1918, the publicity drawn by Paul's protesters and the shifting politics created by Katz campaigning had swung momentum in favor of an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Driven by pressure from the suffragists and recognizing the realities of World War I, President Wilson finally came out in support of the amendment. In 1919, the U.S. House proposed the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, granting women full suffrage. It cleared the U.S. Senate by two votes on June 4, 1919. One hurdle remained, voting by the states. Kansas became the fourth state to ratify the amendment. On August 26, 1920, the 19th Amendment became law. The suffragists had won. Kansans elected their first female state legislator, Minnie Grinstead, from Seward County in 1918. The next year, Lorraine Elizabeth Wooster was the first woman elected to the office of Kansas Superintendent of Public Instruction. 
While Kansas women have made great strides in the last 100 years, there have continued to be many firsts in recent times. Voting remains as important today as it was in 1920. Mary and Kurt King appreciated that right, as retold by her granddaughter. Voting was not a duty for her, and not something she ever postponed or evaded. Voting was a right, a privilege of her citizenship, and something she prized.